Dr. James is a board certified, is board certified in orthopedic surgery and specializes in reconstructive foot and ankle surgery. He focuses on non-surgical and surgical management of foot and ankle conditions. Dr. James is a candidate member of the American Academy of Orthopedic Surgery and the American Orthopedic Foot and Ankle Society. Thank you, Dr. James, for being here today um, to discuss foot and ankle solutions. Hi, thanks for having me. Hopefully everybody can hear me. Let me know if there's any issues with that. Uh, but yeah, we do have a, a little bit here where we can go over some of the most common foot and ankle conditions that I see in the office. And uh, hopefully I have some time to get to a few of your questions. Uh, and that's always typically a fun part of these talks. Uh, I've done these a number of times in the past, and usually this is a an in-person, a lot more interactive thing. So we'll have to kind of make do with teams here, but uh, certainly go ahead and put any questions you have uh, in the chat box and we'll try to get to some. I have some uh, slides and stuff at the end so we can hit some points. Maybe if we don't even uh, talk about them here and you have some general foot and ankle questions, I guess. So a little bit about me. Uh, I grew up in Florida. I went to Florida for undergrad and studied engineering and then went on to Pittsburgh and got my fill of the cold uh, for a little bit and then decided that I needed to be back somewhere warm. Uh, I, I did some time in Orlando doing my residency and then spent a year doing foot and ankle fellowship out in Houston. Since then, I've spent most of my time in um, here at, at BayCare after a couple of years in private practice. And so I've been with BayCare now for about seven years. I practice all over town, uh, so you can find me from north to south Hillsborough, pretty much somewhere uh, on any given day. So this is just a little bit about what do uh, foot and ankle orthopedic surgeons actually do. And uh, this is something where we have some similarities and differences to podiatrists, um, which always gets a little bit confusing. So I actually completed a full orthopedic surgery residency, meaning I took care of uh, trauma and did knee replacements and took care of kids and everything else and then decided I want to specialize in foot and ankle surgery. And so I did an extra year of foot and ankle surgery. Uh, we have a society, uh, the American Orthopedic Foot and Ankle Society, which has a lot of good information for patients, uh, but also kind of governs uh, the, the orthopedic side of foot and ankle treatment. And there's about 2,100 orthopedic surgeons. I think the similar um, society for podiatrists has about 20,000, if I'm, if I'm correct. Uh, so we do a lot of this stuff uh, that you would see trauma and reconstructive type things for the foot and ankle. And then everybody kind of decides how much of the um, other stuff they do. I would say the dividing line for the most orthopedic surgeons for foot and ankle is we do a lot of the, the uh, bone musculoskeletal stuff and then leave um, uh, things like management of toenails and diabetic foot wounds and things like that to the podiatrist for the most part. So today I want to hit a few things and I, and this uh, the foot hygiene tips is what I like to start with because if you have an uh, attention span like mine this way we get some things that are actually useful right at the start and then you can kind of zone out until something strikes your fancy. Uh, we'll hit some of the most common things that I tend to see in the office, bunions, ankle sprains, heel pains in all of its various iterations, and then arthritis through the foot. So foot hy hygiene, I think, is important. And so when I'm talking about this, I'm talking about the th different things we can do to kind of keep our foot health where we need to be. And this first one, you're going to hear it a number of times. Stretching is super, super important and something that uh, comes up a lot in the office. Uh, strengthening of your foot and ankle is obviously important. And then making sure we have appropriate shoe wear and do foot checks if need be. So this calf stretch here uh, is something that I'm demonstrating to patients 15 times a day or more. Uh, this runner stretch where we, we have the back leg straight, the heel flat on the ground, and we lean into it and feel that stretch high up in the calf muscle is super important. I mean, this is something that tends to be very tight for a lot of people and drives a lot of the problems that we, uh, that we tend to see. When I'm having people stretch for helping to improve their function through the foot and ankle, I do like them uh, to stretch for about three minutes per leg and do this a few times a day to really give that muscle a prolonged stretch. Strengthening of the foot. Uh, we have many muscles in our foot, all of which that tend to get weak when we're wearing shoes all the time. And so 
purposefully doing some strengthening stuff for the foot can be very uh, useful. And we have a number of different ways that we'll do this. Um, this one where you're trying to pick up a washcloth or a dirty sock on the floor or something is really nice because it helps you strengthen the most important little muscles in the foot that don't otherwise get strengthened. As far as uh, shoe wear, we talk about this a lot in the office and we want to have shoes that fit uh, well. I think this goes in a few different directions. Uh, one is we all want to be fashionable. We want to do the shoes that, that make us look good. Uh, the narrow toe box shoes can tend to be problematic and we'll see a few examples of that later on. Uh, I don't tell people not to wear them, but I say use them judiciously. As far as uh, also trying on shoes, if you're going to go buy new shoes, go towards the end of the day. Our feet all tend to swell through the course of the day. And if we're buying our shoes in the morning, then they may not fit by the end of the day. There are a few different uh, characteristics of some shoes that, that have uh, come out that can be useful in certain situations. A particularly rigid shoe can be helpful in settings such as flat foot. Uh, the rocker bottom shoe, which was initially popularized with the Skechers Shape Ups and now uh, is more popular with the Hoka's, um, is quite nice for certain uh, issues where we need to offload the forefoot some. And then shoe designs um, can be for a pronated foot or a supinated foot, or we would use varus and valgus foot as, as the, uh, the words for that. But the uh, running shoe stores tend to be very good at helping you find a shoe that's useful and uh, most effective for your foot shape. And then I think this one applies more to um, patients with with diabetes and, or other causes for neuropathy, uh, I would recommend that people check their foot daily or multiple times a day to make sure you're not getting uh, skin breakdown or ulcerations or anything so that we can catch problems before they become a bigger problem. So let's move into some specific problems that we tend to see with the foot and ankle. And uh, the first one that we see a lot is uh, bunions and hammer toes. Then we'll move through ankle sprains, heel pain, uh, and arthritis. So bunions are a super common problem. Uh, we do tend to see this much more significantly in women than men, uh, almost nine to one ratio. And that's likely a combination of uh, shoe wear uh, and to a lesser extent genetics. But we do have some familial component to uh, bunions that we have seen. This is interesting in that if you go to countries that don't tend to wear closed-toed shoes, their rate of bunions is much lower than, than what we see uh, here in the U.S. This is not uh, truly a bump that grows on the toe. It really is the bone shifting out of uh, position and rotating a bit. And if you look down on the, the x-rays on the bottom, you can see the uh, big toe is, is actually angled in at that apex of the deformity. And so this is a problem that's that's created by uh, muscular and bony um, imbalance and the actual shifting of the bones. And as such, if we're going to correct that, we, we do have to correct the bony shape. More often than not, I am talking to people about their bunions and I recommend non-operative things. Uh, a bunion is not something that we prophylactically fix or try to uh, surgically address unless it's causing significant pain. And much of the time with using a wider toe box shoe or having the uh, shoe stretched a little bit in the area of prominence, we can improve discomfort. Uh, these little spacers that you see up at the top right as well tend to be very helpful. As we push the toe back a little bit straighter, you, you make that bump a little bit less prominent and it makes it uh, feel better. The surgical options continue to change substantially. So the uh, picture that you see down at the bottom is what would be considered one of our more, more common uh, bunion surgeries. And in this, uh, you can see at step one, we cut the bone, then we shift it over, pin it in a new position, and then shave off the prominence there. This is one of over a hundred different bunion surgeries that have been described. And so uh, I always tell people if we have a hundred ways to do something, that means we haven't exactly found the right one yet. And so bunions are continuing to progress as far as how we take care of them surgically. 
the new interesting thing that's being uh, looked at now and, and is actually being done is minimally invasive bunions with very small incisions uh, and the uh, long-term effectiveness is is being evaluated at this point. Um, this is something that that is interesting and I think may continue to show good promise. Uh, so far, so good, but uh, I, we're not exactly there yet as far as saying let's go let's go start operating on a ton of these that don't necessarily hurt. Re part of that reason being this isn't an easy recovery. Uh, you have to be off your foot for a period of time. And having uh, recovery from the stiffness and the swelling associated with surgery can take quite a long time, uh, up to four to six months. Hammered toes uh, go along with this. And so uh, hammering of the lesser toes or when the toes start to elevate a bit um, often goes along with the bunions because of the, the big toe displacing the smaller toes. And similarly, we have some uh, non-operative options. A lot of that comes down to the stretching and strengthening that we talked about, uh, but then surgical options if need be. I would say uh, this is another uh, another area where we tend to be fairly judicious in how often we're doing this because it is something that has a, a difficult recovery and not a 100% outcome. It's not something where you do it, you're better, you move on. It's always a little bit more art than science in that in that sense. Another very common thing that we see in the office is ankle sprains. And so the people that end up in my office with an ankle sprain are probably the worst 15% or 20%. Uh, much of the time when you have ankle sprain, you may, uh, you may not see anybody. You may see your primary care doc. You may see an urgent care doc. Uh, so this is something that we see a ton. And when you sprain your ankle, you're actually injuring those ligaments. So on this where it has PTFL, ATFL, and CFL listed, these are our main ankle sprain ligaments with the ATFL being the most common. When you roll your foot and ankle, you either stretch, partially tear, or completely tear uh, these ligaments. And the amount of um, treatment that we have to do for this is dependent on how bad you injure those ligaments. Super common to get a big egg over there. So that's uh, pretty typical to see a substantial amount of swelling with a decent ankle sprain. M much of the time you can put weight on this. Uh, it depends on the severity of it. In the most significant cases, it's very hard to bear weight on it. And those are the ones that I would say I tend to see in the office most. We do note that some people are more likely to get ankle sprains. If you have a higher arched foot, you're actually a little bit more likely to get an ankle sprain because you're already a lot closer to that position of rolling it as opposed to the person with a flat foot. When we are evaluating ankle sprains, one of the first things we typically do is get an x-ray for this. We want to look to see that you didn't uh, actually break your ankle over there, the fibula or that bone that's uh, right in through here. Um, can be broken there, or you can pull a little flake of bone off down where the ligament connects. And uh, we want to know that um, when we see it. We don't routinely get MRIs for these. Uh, we can we can tell we can tell most of what we need to know uh, with the clinical examination and with how the ankle actually is acting. Uh, and MRI isn't super useful in the short term. Where we use MRI for this is if you're not improving as we would expect over uh, the first few months after a significant ankle sprain, then sometimes we'll, we'll use MRI not so much to look at these ligaments, uh, but to look for other injuries such as cartilage uh, injuries to the bones at the ankle. Much of the time, we are going to immobilize you for the more significant ankle sprains. That can be a, uh, a lace-up brace uh, or one of the braces that you get at the drugstore, or it could be more substantial like this boot you see up in the top middle there. Uh, if you're not able to put weight on it, I, I would say I would tend to lean towards putting you in a boot. It protects you a little bit better and it lets it start to heal up where it needs to be. Our goal with this is to get the ligaments to scar in the position that we want to uh, so that we don't have chronic instability at the ankle. Most of the time our immobilization is two to three weeks, usually not much longer than that. And then we start doing the rehab part of this. I would say the rehab is the biggest thing. We've seen uh, and done a number of studies looking at 
different bracing, different techniques for uh, getting people over ankle sprains. And the most important thing that we have is the rehab and particularly this rebuilding proprioception. So proprioception is a word for that complex interplay that's happening between your brain and your ankle to keep you upright. Proprioceptive training and rehabilitation is the only thing that's ever been proven to be protective against your next ankle sprain. And so that's something that we uh, often will send people to physical therapy for the more significant ankle sprains. Uh, surgery is pretty darn rare for ankle sprains. Um, it's uh, the ligament does a pretty good job of scarring in, and our surgery is generally uh, reserved for people that have multiple ankle sprains or chronic instability at the ankle. The next most common, or probably the most common thing we see in the office, is some version of heel pain. Uh, this can be pain at the bottom of your foot. This can be pain at the back of your foot. Uh, and this is a, a, just a huge problem and a, a huge thing that keeps people from doing what they want to. We see this in walkers. We see it in runners. We see it in athletes. We see it in people that stand. Pretty much we see it in everybody. And the main reason for uh, developing this pain is uh, is over tightness of the calf muscles. And so this goes back to that first point of uh, calf stretching being super important. And this is that discussion that we have a whole lot. So plantar fasciitis is what we call the pain when you have it at the bottom of your heel. Uh, this is a, uh, a sharp pain, a stabbing pain, a searing pain, a ice pick pain. I hear all sorts of very interesting descriptions for how terrible this is uh, in the bottom of the, of the foot. And so this is a overuse or stretching type injury to the plantar fascia, which is that tight band that you can feel on the bottom of your foot. You can see on this picture, uh, it looks like a pulley from the toes all the way along the bottom of the foot, through the heel bone and up into your calf muscle. And this whole system does work as one uh, long unit and one uh, interconnected system. This is something that we almost exclusively treat non-surgically, um, calf stretching being the most important. There's that guy stretching again. Uh, but we'll do other things to help symptomatically with, with the pain there. These little heel cups that you see uh, or heel lifts tend to be useful. Rolling the foot gently on a frozen water bottle, uh, anti-inflammatories, occasionally the night splints that you see up in the top right and then even more rarely putting you in a boot or something for a period of immobilization. Uh, vast majority of the time, within a few weeks of starting the stretching, we can start to see some improvement. We don't expect for it to go away that quickly necessarily, depending on how long it's been going on, but we start to see some changes in either the severity level, how long it takes you to get going in the morning before it loosens up, or how far you can go before it starts to hurt you. Rarely are we doing more invasive things than this. Most common would be steroid shots. I'm pretty cautious in using steroid shots for this. So anytime we put a steroid in uh, in the body, uh, particularly not inside a joint, we can weaken the tissues. So we see this um, with repetitive steroid injections into the area of plantar fascia, we can actually weaken that tissue and make it more apt to rupture. We're looking at some other things such as platelet-rich plasma, and I have a picture of that in a minute. This is a, a um, stimulation of the body to heal by taking your blood out and spinning it down and sending it back in to or injecting it back into these spots to try to stimulate some additional healing. We've looked at some different things, shockwave therapy, um, which has some success in certain cases. But the most effective uh, shockwave therapy was actually with the uh, the same shockwave machine they used to break up um, kidney stones. And that, when you're putting it on the foot where it already hurts, tends to be very painful. So it's hard to get a more uh, powerful enough shockwave therapy without doing a complete nerve block, which is not super common for this. And then surgery is, is the most rare thing. And, and what is the most effective surgery is still up for debate. The um, classically described surgeries for plantar fasciitis involve cutting uh, half to about a half of the width of the plantar fascia and just leaving a gap there to stimulate some level of healing. 
I think either that forms scar tissue or it just ruptures the rest of the plantar fascia. And uh, in which case it doesn't hurt because now it's not ripping anymore. Um, but the plantar fascia does have a role in, in how we maintain our arch of our foot. So we try to avoid that if possible. The cousin of plantar fasciitis is Achilles tendonitis or Achilles tendinosis. And so on the back of the heel, uh, we can get excess tightness through the Achilles itself and even get some calcification in it, which we can see in this x-ray here, or we can uh, see on this picture on the right, this is an MRI um, showing an, a little area of partial tearing and some swelling inside the tendon with some thickening of it. And this is the prominences that you can feel on your heel if you have uh, Achilles tendonitis. This is usually a long-standing issue. It's related to the tight calf muscle. And most of the time, um, physical exam and, and x-ray are going to be most useful. MRI occasionally we'll use if we can't get you better with some of our simple things. The treatment options are generally going to be a lot of the same stuff that we talked about for plantar fasciitis with calf stretching being the most important thing. Uh, but then we look at some other stuff, sometimes immobilization. This one tends to take a very long time. The uh, Achilles has a poor blood supply in general. And so initially we're just keeping it from getting worse by getting it stretched out. Uh, but then eventually we want the Achilles to heal itself. And that takes quite a long time. The book answer for this one is uh, at least six months of good non-operative management once the calf muscle is adequately stretched out. And so this is one that tends to uh, to be ongoing for quite a long time. We try to uh, obviously avoid surgery for this as well. Uh, there is a surgery described for this where uh, particularly these insertional ones where you see that, that bone spur at the back of the heel where we go in and cut the Achilles tendon and peel it off the bone and then take off these bony prominences and, and reattach the Achilles. The downside of that is that uh, we have effectively created an Achilles rupture. And so you have a very long recovery for this, that six to eight months uh, that would be typical for an Achilles rupture. Um, here again, we talk about the PRP and the stem cells. Uh, this is what the PRP looks like when we're doing it. You actually aspirate some of your own blood, put it into a centrifuge, and um, we use the part of the blood that's primarily platelets and pro-inflammatory um, cytokines or these signaling molecules re-inject this into an area with chronic injury in an attempt to uh, stimulate healing in that area. And so there's a lot of research being done on PRP and stem cells, which would go along uh, in the same vein and um, their usefulness and where they're most effective. Uh, there certainly are some studies to show some effectiveness for this, uh, but they're not really strong yet and not strong enough to the point that the insurance companies are covering them. So this tends to be very expensive. PRP, I think, is running about in this area, about $800 to $1,000 per injection. And then stem cells uh, in the two to $3,000 per treatment. Um, so very expensive and not something that's extensively used or approved at this point. Arthritis is, is probably the next thing that walks in most commonly in my office. Um, you know, I see a lot of foot and ankle. I, I do see a lot of other uh, joints and body parts as well. And so your knee arthritis, your shoulder arthritis, and, and uh, all of these are similar. The foot and ankle arthritis is interesting because we don't see a ton of it from just day-to-day -day wear and tear. Most of the time with foot and ankle arthritis, we see it as a result of um, previous trauma. Uh, it can be a result of previous infection that's not super common or other infl inflammatory conditions, um, uh, including crystal type things like gout and pseudogout, rheumatoid arthritis and, and psoriasis or psoriatic arthritis. I see it probably most frequently in the big toe, like you're seeing down in that bottom picture, in the ankle uh, fairly commonly, and then the midfoot is actually a pretty common place for arthritis as well. Like we said, most of this is, occurs as a result of previous trauma. Uh, X-rays are going to be our mainstay for, for looking at this. And when you come see us in the office, we tend to do weight-bearing X-rays. That gives us the most accurate picture of uh, what's happening when you're actually standing on it. Um, what's happening when you're laying on it isn't as, isn't as important as when you're standing on it. 
Sometimes we use MRI or CT scan if we need better imaging or we need to see some other details that we can't see on the x-ray. But we tend to uh, also see a fairly common picture. You get sore there. Uh, you have more discomfort as you walk long distances, stiffness, swelling. Um, all of these can play a role and be found when we have arthritis anywhere through the foot and ankle. A lot of this is treated without surgery. And you see this is kind of a repetitive thing. Uh, more of what I do is non-surgery than surgery. Uh, not quite as fun, I'll say, but uh, but uh, we, we do our very best to avoid surgery if possible. Um, ice and anti-inflammatories can be useful for this depending on the location of the arthritis. Uh, we'll often do um, bracing. Sometimes physical therapy uh, can be useful. Weight loss is a big one. Um, the foot and ankle, it directly impacts how much uh, forces are going across these joints and little changes can make a big difference. Where I probably discuss this the most is, is in my patients with knee arthritis and uh, a pound of weight loss takes about four pounds of force off the knee. And so this is something uh, that little changes can make huge differences in your in your um, general happiness and how parts feel. This is one of the places where we will often use rocker bottom shoes. So rocker bottom shoes uh, can help us offload parts of the foot or make parts of the foot not have to move as much by taking some of the up and down motion and shifting it to the shoe. And then here we will actually use steroid injections, not infrequently. Um, steroid injections are a powerful way to reduce inflammation and are a little bit safer when we're putting them inside the joint. It's not something we want to do on a regular basis or do super frequently because the medicines that we put in do have some level of toxicity to the cartilage, uh, but it can be useful when we're trying to kick the can down the road and avoid surgery or uh, delay surgery for significant arthritis through the foot and ankle. Uh, the ankle in particular is the most interesting one here for talking about. Um, for ankle arthritis, we have a number of different things we will do for this. And for our mild to moderate arthritis, we'll often do what you see up in the top right corner, which is uh, what we call an ankle arthroscopy or an ankle scope. So I'm able to put a camera inside the joint there uh, and go look and see uh, how the cartilage looks, sometimes perform um, some cartilage repair type procedures where we're trying to stimulate new cartilage growth. Uh, and a lot of times we're debriding or removing some of the bony spurs and things that are causing some impingement or limiting motion. And this can actually be very helpful in the, in the moderate stages of arthritis of the ankle. As you get more severe arthritis, uh, we tend to start have to talk about bigger procedures and that gets into the debate of ankle fusions versus ankle replacements. So on the left you see an ankle replacement x-ray and then a and then a cartoon picture of what it looks like. Uh, this would be one of the more um, common current, uh, uh, this one's getting to be a little bit older, uh, but one of the the more current ankle replacements and in this, we're taking out the bone, we're taking out the cartilage, and we're putting metal components in there to replace that space to maintain motion at the ankle. Uh, the alternative to that would be doing an ankle fusion where we take out the cartilage and then put screws or plates across it to just stimulate healing and make it one solid um, joint there. And so in that setting, you're sacrificing what remains of motion, which is usually pretty limited at that stage. And uh, uh, getting rid of the motion in exchange for not having pain there. This is a debate that goes on uh, at every foot and ankle meeting, which is better. And uh, fusion has been the gold standard for a long time and ankle replacements are getting better. They're a relatively new technology and they haven't caught up to uh, knee replacements and hip replacements as far as longevity or what we necessarily allow you to do after uh, an ankle replacement. And so, um, we have those discussions uh, when the arthritis gets bad enough to to start to be considering these things. Big toe arthritis is is uh, probably the next most common place that we see and are intervening for. Uh, we see this a ton in people that have gout. 
Uh, we also see this in a ton in people that don't have any known injuries. And what we think this likely is, is all those times you kind of stump your toe or jam it as a kid, you you uh, beat up the cartilage just a little bit and over time it wears out. So what happens is you start to narrow that space between the two bones that we can see on the x-ray here. And then you get this bigger spur up on the top of the metatarsal head. And that starts to act as a uh, almost like a doorstop and the toe doesn't want to move quite as well. So x-rays are a great place to start for this. And we try a lot of non-surgical stuff. Uh, this is one where a stiff sole shoe tends to be particularly useful. Uh, when we make your shoe a bit more rigid, we decrease the amount of motion that has to happen through that toe, and that can make you a lot more comfortable. We can also accomplish this with what we call a carbon fiber plate, and so uh, or turf toe plate, and that's what the, um, the the plate you see is up on the top right picture this can make any sort of shoe a little bit stiffer and the way you use that is you take out your insert put this in and then put the insert back on top and uh, that helps to keep the toe from moving quite as much uh, ice anti-inflammatories the typical things are useful for this activity modification so a lot of times this doesn't bug people unless you're doing something that that's making that toe want to dorsiflex or or come up a good deal, and so this can be sometimes as simple as uh, when you're doing your yoga, you're slightly turning the foot out so that that toe doesn't have to move as much, and so we can see that quite often. Our surgical options for big toe arthritis um, in or in the orthopedic surgery world come down to primarily what we call a chylectomy. Uh, which we see in that top picture where we go and take off the top 20-ish percent of the bone there, including that bone spur, and that takes that doorstop away so the toe can move better. This is a cleanup procedure. This is a temporizing procedure that can help um, make you feel better for a while, but the bone spurs do tend to come back, and this doesn't solve the underlying arthritis. And so uh, it's definitely a, a temporary procedure, but sometimes this will get people five, eight, 10 years of uh, improved function at their foot. Eventually, when that joint is no longer um, functioning very well, it's painful, and all the things we've tried non-operative that don't, don't work, then we tend to fuse the joint. And so in the bottom picture, we've gone in and we've taken out what remains of the cartilage down there and put a plate and screws on it to uh, create a solid bone across there, again, sacrificing motion for pain relief. Joint replacements for the big toe have been tried a number of times in a number of different ways. Um, this is something that's more common in the podiatry world. Uh, I would say they tend to work well for a short period of time and then they fail. And, um, and now we have a big bony defect to try to fuse across and it can make this uh, quite problematic. And so not something that you commonly find orthopedic surgeons doing. So that was a whirlwind tour of what I usually see in the office on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, there's a lot of other things that exist out there uh, and many other flavors of how this works. Um, there's great places to find some good information. And so across not only foot and ankle, but all orthopedic things, orthoinfo.aaos.org. That's the American Academy of Orthopedic Surgeons patient information website has a bunch of great stuff. So from uh, finding out something about your particular condition uh, or finding a rehab protocol or um, some exercises that can be useful, uh, tons of good information on there. And then the Academy or the uh, AOFAS also has a foot specific patient education website, which is that second link right there, a second link right there, uh, or come see me. Uh, you can find me all over town. I go to St. Joe's North up in Lutz. I go to St. Joe's South and Riverview, uh, the main hospital on MLK, and I'm in South Tampa on uh, Friday morning. So I'm all over town, and I'm happy to talk about these things and, uh, and get you some answers to get you feeling better. So Thank I you. do. Have, oh, sorry. I do have um, yeah a number of pictures here that we can go through. If there's any more specific questions um, or general questions or anything I said wasn't clear. 
Absolutely. Thank you. Um, there are a decent amount of questions in the chat, so um, some of them you may have answered or maybe we can just remind everyone of. Um, but the first one is, uh, do you have any recommendations for running shoes? So, uh, yeah, so the, I think the biggest recommendation for running shoes is um, make sure you have a good fitting. And so uh, finding a good running shoe store um, that works with you is is probably the best place. It's going to be very variable depending on foot shape and running style. So whether you're a four foot strike, mid foot strike, hind foot strike. Um, I particularly like uh, the New Balance stores tend to do a good job. I like um, Fit to Run in the International Mall. Uh, I send people there a good deal. Uh, and then there's some of the smaller running shoe stores, uh, Running Center and a number of other local ones where um, where they put you a lot of times on a pressure plate to look and see how you actually load your foot. Uh, and some of them will even do a little mini gait analysis uh, to make sure you're getting the shoe that's right for you. Uh, I think it, it kind of fluctuates as to what the most populars are. The Brooks, the Asics, uh, more commonly the Hoka's and the Ons are co are popular, um, but that's kind of I think that's kind of a popularity contest. It's going to depend on your foot more than anything. Thank you. Um, I know this came in a little earlier, but they're asking about sharp pain in the arch of the foot and maybe a condition or suggestion for arch of the foot or heel, I guess maybe. You yeah, so that, that. Would, that would probably, 90% of the time, that's the plantar fasciitis. Uh, and so the calf stretching is probably the biggest starting point for that. And I've I always joke that that's going to be my, uh, my retirement uh, thing is going to be come up with some simple insert, you know, simple gel insert or something, and then a video that goes along with it where I just sit with you and chat while we, uh, while we stretch your calf muscle and that'll get you better. <laughs> So you go around that um, line, a lot of people are asking for the exercises. So we will send out this PowerPoint um, that has a few of them. And then I know you have the, the websites here. Um, yeah, so the, you... um, the, there's an ankle conditioning one on the ortho info uh, website that I use a ton. Uh, that would probably be a great starting point, uh, starting point for that. Um, let's see. What are some reasons someone would have to have an ankle surgery and what type of surgery is performed for an ankle? So that can be, uh, so most common ankle surgery I probably do is actually ankle fractures, which we didn't even talk about because that kind of fits more into the trauma realm. Um, so, so probably the most common ankle surgery I do is ankle fractures, then uh, then into probably the ankle scopes where we're cleaning up arthritis. And then less commonly would be ankle fusions and uh, ligament reconstructions and and the such. Are there any what let's see what do you recommend for people with flat feet? Any kind of shoe or stretches or anything specific for people with flat feet? Flat flat foot is interesting. Um, flat foot is a there's two flavors. So there's the flat foot that you've had all your life. You know, one where you where you heard that your parents had you in in special shoes and orthotics and stuff as a kid. And so the flat foot that you've had all your life is is what we consider to be a physiologic flat foot. That's a familial thing. It's your normal foot shape. And as long as it's not painful or it's or it's um, you know, within the realm of not terrible we can usually get that better with strengthening exercises and occasionally an orthotic or something like that. That's different from the flat foot that develops as an adult. So if you had a normal flat or a normal shaped foot all your life and then have developed a collapsing foot, then that's related to one of the tendons called the posterior tibial tendon being weakened over time. And that was one where we have to, uh, want to evaluate you but kind of work down the strengthening of that tendon maybe some bracing and whatnot and that one sometimes is surgical in in the most significant cases um so i think it kind of depends on on what was the onset of that flat foot whether it was a, a cute or more all of your life sort of situation um someone's asking about recommendations for cmt disease cmt is a uh 
that's an interesting one. So it's a pretty rare um, neurologic condition where the foot becomes progressively higher arched over time. Uh, that is one that is usually, I would say, I've seen the best results when it's kind of managed at, at a tertiary care type setting where you can have uh, your neurologist and your foot and ankle surgeon um, all working together because that one's uh, that one's a bit tougher. Uh, yeah, I see it, and a lot of times I'll actually refer that one to some of the higher level facilities. Do you have any recommendations uh, to improve range of motion after a fibula and malleosis fracture and ankle dislocation? Mm -hmm. So. Uh, so I would start with the calf stretching. I would say that tends to be the uh, most rigid part of it. And and as you're stretching out the calf muscle, you're also stretching out the rest of the uh, flexor tendons that get tightened. Um, most of the time when people have uh, are displeased with their motion after an ankle fracture, it's because there's not enough upwards motion or dorsiflexion. Let me pull up that. Uh, these pictures are great for that. Um, on on this picture on the left side, you want the foot to be able to come up. And sometimes we start to see that there's some bony spurs or other impinging structures in the front. And that may be something where uh, the ankle scope that, that I talked about can be useful. So it kind of depends on what's the cause for the stiffness, whether it's soft tissue stuff or, or some sort of bony stiffness. Uh, but the calf stretching is a great place to start for that. Um, they want your opinion on popping ankles or chiropractic type services, or is that a big no-no in your opinion? I don't think it's a no-no necessarily. Um, I think there are, there are some, um, some mobilization things, uh, that can be useful. Uh, I am big on physical therapy for the foot and ankle and so the i would say a lot of the physical therapy stuff kind of jumps off from where chiropractic ends where you get some mobilization but then you add in the strengthening and the stuff that will make it continue to be better um i i have and see people that get good benefit from chiropractic but i think you have to add in the strength stuff too uh i think that's super important the balance part Absolutely. Um, someone's asking if calf stretches will help with uh, pain that is focused on the front ankle and top of the foot. Maybe. <laughs> um, kind of kind of depends on on what it is that's driving that. So uh, front ankle, if it's kind of a radiating pain from front of the ankle down into the top of the foot, we see that one commonly after chronically after ankle sprains like six or eight months down the road where it didn't quite get strong enough and the ankle doesn't like to be wiggly and so if it's not as strong as it needs to be or the balance isn't great you'll get a, just a little bit of swelling up in the front of the ankle and uh as it does that it's pushing the nerve out and it's making the nerve want to get pinched in you know in between your shoe and and your ankle and so a lot of times when i when i hear that sort of story um it actually is nerve irritation. And so that one's related to um, balance strengthening and, and desensitization type stuff more often. Is there a brace to prevent bunions? No, not really, no. Uh, there's a number of things. There's, there's some crazy torture looking devices that you try to wear at nighttime that will help stretch it and, and whatnot. Uh, we've, never we've never proven that those prevent or uh, or correct bunions. Um, they may make you more comfortable in the in the short term, but the little bunion spacers probably work just as well for that. And um, they yeah, not a lot of not a lot of evidence to suggest that those are super useful. And you can try them, but I wouldn't spend a lot of money. Someone is asking how often you are doing or performing ankle surgeries. Mm -hmm. Uh, so I generally operate on uh, Mondays, um, so weekly we're doing stuff. Um, and then have you ever heard of a surgery for hammer toe that doesn't require a pin coming out of the toe? 
So there are some uh, implants for hammer toes um, where instead of, uh, so most of the time with a hammer toe, uh, the reason you're doing the surgery is because it starts to get rigid there. If you still have a flexible hammer toe, I recommend non-op. Um, but surgically, what we're typically doing is cutting out a joint and and then shortening that toe and then making it straight. And so whatever you can do to kind of hold it in that position is fine. It doesn't have to even form bone across there. A scar tissue uh, bridge across there is just fine. Um, so there are some implants that go in the joint there instead of a pin coming out the tip that gets pulled later. So there are some ways to do that. I would say... Um, it's kind of dealer's choice and there's not there's never been a big functional difference noted or we can't show a big uh improvement in our overall outcomes with that part of that being that hammer and toe outcomes are are almost uniformly not very good uh for hammer toe surgeries i tell people there's about a 70 percent chance of a good or excellent outcome and a 30 percent chance of a of a fair or poor outcome and that's what we've seen kind of across the board uh over the years Thank you. And I know we are right at time, um, but a lot, of, a lot of people are saying that they're going to be calf stretching now. <laughs> and that, you know, thank you for the presentation. Um, there is, if say, if there is one more, let's see, one more question. Um, if you, if that's okay, yeah, we'll finish absolutely. on this one. Um, let's see. It says, what would, what would cause periodic pain going from the back of the ankle to the calf? And they said suggestions, but I'm going to guess a calf stretch would be a good suggestion. <laughs> uh, that one actually starts to overlap with the sciatic nerve in the back. I've actually been having that over the last two weeks pretty terribly. It's like this searing pain in my calf muscle um, that that I'm pretty certain is from my back. So uh, pinched nerves at your back or along your sciatic nerve is probably more common for once we're getting that more uh, longer pain, but it, it kind of depends on what the character characteristics of the pain are. Uh, and we can actually usually elicit that on exam, but some uh, sciatic nerve stretch exercises would be useful as well. And that is something you can Google and find some good stuff. Thank you. Um, I believe that is it. Uh, thank you guys all for joining today. Um, and uh, I appreciate Dr. James being on the call today. Thanks for having me. Hope you all have a good day and uh, good luck calf stretching. <laughs>